and Milton for the invitation. And I'm going to bring you down to earth in that uh, I will be talking about the limits of uh, conventional IVF. But essentially what I want to talk about is uh, the limits of understanding purely all-side biology and how in the first four years of IVF, our poor understanding of all-side biology make me to state that yes, we have reached a limit with our conventional way of doing IVF. So I will cover the inefficiency of the system. I will cover how really the inefficiency is in somehow related in us being humans and having a low fecundity rate compared to other animals. And then I will touch upon, uh, in a non-provocative way, the vain efforts in improving human biology. Vain because, I, again, as I I'm telling you at the outset, we have not yet been able to succeed. And then what is the solution for uh, going forward, waiting for someone to really unravel the initial stages of a follicologenesis, which may aid in improving in vitro fertilization results. So when we do report our results, we use simple mathematics. And these are the simple mathematical calculations that I'm going to drive you through to show you that in four years we have not been able to improve all side biology, but just the rates, the mathematics, okay? So we, for example, when we talk about the implantation rate, we define implantation rate at the, at the numerator, how many embryos you transfer, at the denominator you put how many embryos you have transferred. Now, an easy way to improve implantation rate is to transfer fewer embryos, still keep the same pregnancy, you have improved your implantation rate. The same for pregnancy. We reported pregnancy per cycle, pregnancy per retrieval, pregnancy per transfer. And again, if you change the denominator by modifying the transfer numbers or modifying the retrieval numbers, cancellation rate, for example, all of these are all going to change and may look better. But these simple mathematic calculations we have not changed, by doing so, the biology of the SDO side. <coughs> so I've been studying this for, uh, for the last 20 years. I, push, I, pu I published a couple of papers, the first one uh, uh, in 2005, looking at how many embryos produced in the IVF lab and transferred, they give a baby born. So there are two publications I want to review with you, one in 2005, one in 2017. And you see that uh, in 2005, the first review showed that only 15%, 15% of all the embryos transferred in the United States over the course of those uh, initial seven years of, of study, they produced the baby. The other 85% they did not. And then uh, lately, another 10 years of observation, many more millions of embryos transferred. The number of babies born only 20%. So if you look at the first, uh, uh, the, the first publication of the 2005, you see here on the, on the highlighted in green that the number of embryos discarded or wasted was very high. And that really shows you the mathematic. Like in 1995, we were transferring a mean embryo of uh, almost four. The total number of embryos transferred almost 124,000. The baby's born 11,419, so 91% of the embryos were wasted. And the transfer for delivery is about 25%. But then look in red. In 97, now just by simply changing the mathematic, in other words, transferring fewer embryos instead of four, now we go to three, okay? You see that you have reduced your wastage rate from 91 to 85%. And then if you keep looking and looking and looking now, the last uh, uh, 10 years of analysis, again in red square, you can see that by just decreasing your denominator, mean number of embryo transferred, now down to two in 2013, your wastage rate is now 76%, but overall 80% of embryos are transferred. So please note 
In these 10 years, you have 1,800,000 embryos, 1,800,000 embryos produced after in vitro, and only 358,000 babies born. So there is a tremendous, tremendous wastage of biological material. And uh, it's not only in the United States, okay? Look at the, at the Australia, New Zealand data here. What's the number of uh, fresh cycle that produced a baby? 23.5%. So again, a very low success rate, and this uh, compares very well with the uh, United States data, but it's also in Europe. Look how many more, more, how many more cycles, how many more embryos produced out of the millions, seven million and a half, only 22% all over Europe in this l large statistics produce the baby, okay? So it's not only an American problem or in, an Australian problem, it's also an European problem, which uh, underlined the concept that from zygote, from fertilization to baby, as here in the, in the yellow circle, only about 7%, 7%. Of the 2PN fully used become a baby. Tremendous wastage. So when we looked at the how many eggs you are wasting in the process, the uh, data are even more disappointing. And you see that when we first published this paper in 2009, a lot of criticism, when I said that in donor eggs, only 7% of the eggs produced in donors, once fully utilized, then transferred, they give a baby. They said, wow, that's very too low. That's only a year. No, it's not. And then uh, younger than 35 or 37, only 4% of the eggs. And then as women age, only 1% of the eggs produce the baby. This also replicated by Michael Tucker, exactly the same data on 193,000 oocytes, that in donor eggs, only 6 to 7% produce the baby, and fewer and fewer as women age. And then replicated in Belgium, the same exactly concept across the world, which means one more time that the oocyte biology across all these years has not changed. Only few, few, few eggs with our conventional IVF become baby once fully utilized. We had the fresh transfer, frozen transfer, all accounted for. So 20% of the embryo transfer so far, that's my summary for now, result in a live birth. Five or six percent of the eggs collected in the conventional way, conventional IVF and fully utilized, result in a live birth. If a woman is younger than 37, seven percent in the egg donor. Women older than 40, one or two percent of the eggs, baby. Therefore, there is a worldwide, worldwide, very high biological wastage that has been unchanged over the years, as I demonstrated you with the data that are commonly published and known. Why? These are some of possible explanation, uh, probably by rescuing follicles that are destined to atresia. We are already harvesting oocytes that are not destined to become a baby. Only few oocytes, perhaps, are la leading a live birth per year. So there are only a few cycles in a year where a woman, even if she's young, is really reproductively competent. And I will demonstrate this with the next few slides. And particularly in women, or 40 or older, if the oocyte to baby rate is so low, one or two percent, maybe they have a much fewer months in a year where they do have a good egg. Therefore, what we do today, we just do few cycles in older women. We just give up very quickly, and we try to, to do egg donation, because after one cycle, two cycles, and no success, we think that she should go to egg donation, when in reality, perhaps you should continue to do more because there are fewer months per year where there is that golden egg. Now, Sherman Silber has done a very elegant paper that uh, really proved my concept in that only few months in a year are um, uh, with, the, with the competent oocyte. And what he did here really looked at the fecundity rate in natural cycles, no drugs, only one egg per patient, in, uh, in a very large number of uh, cycles, about almost 14,000, with 14,000 eggs retrieved here. And you see how many were uh, live birth. Of the 14,000 eggs, 14,000 eggs, 1,900 babies. 
So that really produced what I think is a, a landmark paper where finally we know what is the fecundity rate of humans in that when a woman is younger than 35, the fecundity rate is about 25%, meaning that it takes really an average of four months to get to chance of having a baby. But as women old, and if you look at uh, women that are over the age of 40, you need many, many more months because these are, again, natural cycles, okay? So here in the graph, it tells you that the woman that is 41 years old, you need the 15 eggs, which means 15 months. In a woman that is 42 years old, you need the 22 eggs. Well, that means 22 months. But if a woman is younger than, than 35 or 35, you need four months or four eggs because, as I told you, we're in natural cycles, right? So now we know that fecundity rate, our background reproductive potential as humans, is 25% fecundity rate, now proven without any doubt. And therefore, these are the data where, to which we need to confront ourselves when we do IVF. So, can ART be improved? Can we improve the results? And what I want to discuss now here, and be a little provocateur, is that there are a lot of ads on that have been brought to the forefront, but there are some potential in this ads on Unfortunately, many, the great majority, are still unvalidated. But I want to still bring you back to the key message that I'm trying to, to give to you, that the oocyte biology has not been yet able to be changed, human oocyte biology. And let's go through some of these ads on. This is a paper that uh, uh, Joyce Harper from UK put out, saying that there are many of the ads on, but the evidence is still lacking, and she focused on a list of them, embryo glue, sperm DNA fragmentations. But what I will be focusing on this particular case is the PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing, time lapse. And uh, probably you cannot read this, but this just came a month ago from the UK, saying that the EHFEA has now issued regulations in which any clinics if it's true what is written in this report, that is doing ads on, even as simple as an assisted hatching, or a time lapse, or an endometrial scratch, they need to inform the patient that is an unproved, okay, ads on. This is a must now for, for UK. Now, the assumption on the PGTA, that mosaicism in blastocyst is very low, one or two percent, the testing is 100% accurate, precise, without false positive and false negative, and that the biopsy does not reduce the viability of the embryo. Well, these are the facts. The fact is that interpreting trophectoderm biopsy is still very problematic, even with the next generation sequencing, which I think should not be called NGS anymore, but this generation sequencing, because we are waiting for the next. <laughs> this is now this generation sequencing still has a problem. Maybe 20% or 30% of mosaicism. Some may argue even higher than that. And the proof and the facts are that there are babies born from the trans, and these are healthy children, from the transfer of embryos that were otherwise destined to be non-transferred. So when I debate with the, uh, with the colleagues on the PGT issues, they say, well, but you, never, you, ne you only discuss, discuss, but you don't uh, take care of the randomized controlled trials that have been done. You need to do more studies on that. Well, I don't need to do the study. You need to prove to me that these babies that have been born were not a proof of a, a mistake. These were errors. Otherwise, these babies were not being born. And 33% in the, in, the, in the paper of uh, Greco et al. from Italy do, that were originally called as abnormal, yeah? when they were transferred, they gave rise to completely normal baby uh, at birth. And the Escheret study with an expansion of that Greco study is another 31%, 31% of completely healthy babies. And then there was uh, this paper from Santiago Munet that this is a very recent one, December of 2017, a year ago, where you see here in the, in the red square that there is a percent of uh, embryo mosaicism and the transfer of this embryo mosaicism 
And then uh, in the last column, how many resulted in uh, an ongoing or delivered pregnancy? So overall, about 40%. 40% of embryos labeled as mosaicism by Santiago paper, they gave, a, they gave a pregnancy ongoing or already delivered. So therefore, this is the rate of the false positive, somewhere between 20 and 30%. And this couple from Connecticut went on the Wall Street Journal this year because this lady had two years of, inf of infertility. She's 44 years old. She was told that uh, this time, even this time, the transfer has to be canceled after three transfers that were canceled because of no normal embryos. She insisted. She went against medical advice, and she said, no, I want to transfer both my embryos that I had. She had one normal, and one was uh, an unemployed embryo. And here are the two babies, okay? So uh, that's another proof that babies can be born by the transfer of un unemployed uh, or mosaic embryos. What about the false negative rate? This is a study from uh, uh, Jimmy Griffo from NYU. What they did, they transferred the embryos that were euploid, okay? So you transfer euploid embryos. They were uh, euploid by the old but then uh, very uh, effective technique of CCS, chromosomal comprehensive screening, with RACGH, so they transferred. Then uh, these people with euploid, euploid embryos, they miscarried. So what they do? They went back and said, let's, let's look again at this data, and let's reanalyze the biopsy that we had by NGS. And when they did the NGS, they found that there was about 36% of those embryos that were originally called as normal, that in reality they were not. So there is a false negative of 36%. I looked at the false negative rate in our own uh, field, in our own uh, clinic, and what I asked Michael Simone, one of the residents, I said, you know what, let's look at all the time where we transferred two euploid embryo by NGS, and only one of the two implants and deliver, or how many of these euploid embryos really produce a live birth? So now there is a, this, the uterus has been completely removed from the equation because at least one was a live birth of the two, okay? And when we do the calculation, we found that 25% of the embryos that were euploid by PGS, NGS, they did not implant, or they miscarried. So there is a 25% false negative. We also looked, and we have not yet enough data, at gestational surrogacy cases. Now the uterus is one of the best uterus that you can ever have. And transferring euploid NGS embryos, how many do not implant? And even there, we have about 20% that do not implant. A claim from Nathan Treff says, well, mosaicism with the current technique is overdiagnosed. So since the great majority of unemployees are uh, unemployees that are meiotic in origin, in other words, the egg, when it comes in your lab, is already, is already impacted by unemployee, okay? Mitotic errors, the ones that give rise to mosaicism, that are extremely, extremely low. These are, this is a problem of the labs, where you send your specimen, they don't know what they are doing, they don't know what they are looking at, okay? So if the error is meiotic in origin, the STAR study should have shown that, right? So they did the polar body analysis here. Polar, first polar body, second polar body, and they did the study, randomized control studies, that showed that the analysis of the polar body versus no analysis of the polar body did not increase, did not increase substantially the live birth. So there was no statistical difference whether you do or you do not do analysis of the polar body. And therefore, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine that has reviewed, has reviewed in depth all the randomized controlled studies that the opponent, when I do a debate, says, oh, you never, you never bring up the randomized controlled studies. Well, the SRM has done it for me and says that at the present, there is insufficient evidence, and this is 2018, to recommend the routine use of uh, blastocyst biopsy with unemployed testing in all infertile patients. And then I want to give you a very preliminary uh, new study that we did on a survey with the www.ivfworldwide.com. 
speared by Norbert and myself. What we did, we asked around the world how many uh, clinics are uh, doing a PGS, PGTA, and for what reason? 125 clinics responded, and they are doing PGTA, 77% for advanced maternal age. They were a multiple choice, allow, uh, multiple answer. Therefore, 70% uh, recurrent implantation failure, 65% in uh, unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss, 25% sex determination, but 14%, they do it on everyone, okay? Now, as you know, if you read the literature, none of this indication has been proven to be uh, a justification for the PGTA, particularly the uh, uh, unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss and the advanced maternal age. So when we asked, okay, have you ever transferred abnormal embryos? 25 of these 125 clinics, they answered, yes, we have transferred abnormal embryos by, B by PGTA. All right. And what happened to these uh, 25 clinics that transferred embryos? How many cycles have you done? Well, 215 cycles in red here, they transferred abnormal embryos. All right. Over these 215 cycles, what happened? Look at the top. 215 transfer abnormal embryos. 126 got pregnant, of which 49%, some are ready delivered, some are still ongoing. Is that something that is remarkable? These are embryos that were supposed to be uh, discarded. They transferred against medical advice, and they have produced either already a baby or they are ongoing. 49%. It's a toss of a coin. Now, if we think that this can be extrapolated to these 201 live birth deliveries from uh, uh, the transfer of abnormal embryos can be the extrapolation to the current CDC data. In other words, if just we can uh, add or estimate how many more babies we could have in the United States but just by c counting these units in which they are transferring abnormal embryos in the United States, we can have another 200 babies easily. So, and lastly on that, the ads on has now gone one more step saying, this is a CCRM, the, uh, the uh, Schoolcraft group in Colorado, that at the last ASRM two months ago, they reported the breaking news that now you can do testing of the blastocysts, not by biopsying them anymore, by just taking some fluid from the blastocyst cavity or the spent culture media, and now you can do a non-invasive test that is much more safe, non-invasive, and reliable. Really? Very impressed. The diagnostic efficacy of a blastocyst fluid and spent culture media is not reliable. And this is a, a, a study that comes from a, a good group from uh, uh, Italy, from Rome. That's uh, Ubaldi and Rienzi. So based on current methodology, what Schoolcraft was already claiming and, and, and trying to offer now, blastocyst fluid or spent blastocyst culture media, is not, is not reliable. So therefore, that's why I, I wrote this paper a few, uh, few weeks ago that we really should take a, a step back and before we adopt pre-implantation embryo testing and all the variation on the, on the topic, we should really uh, do the studies that are required to be done. Time lapse. Time lapse, in order to prove that it's valid, you should do the last experiment, which is, see, the time lapse is uh, an incubator, and, and then you select the embryos that the time lapse is suggesting you to select. But this should be compared with the standard selection and uh, uh, with an incubator that also has the opportunity to be a closed incubator, not open and closed. And the, the only one that has done the randomized controlled study is the group in Boston by Kathy Rakonsky. And what I want to show you is, uh, is there, that what they did, they randomized the patient in uh, day three, single embryo transfer, single, with embryos selected by the uh, time lapse. Then they did the day five single embryo transfer with the embryo selected by time lapse versus day five em single embryo transfer with the embryo purely selected by morphology, but in a closed system, not opening and closed. So now if the time lapse is good, is better, you should see the, the difference, right? 
There is a difference. That it is not better. Actually, it's worse. And you can see here that by doing the day five alone, by taking the standard morphology in a closed system, your, by intention to treat your pregnancy rate is 47% versus 33% on the day five selected by time lapse. For me also here, the case is closed and I do not have a time lapse IEL. And this also from a Cleveland clinic saying that uh, time lapse in a randomized control trials did not improve, did not improve the clinical outcome. All right, so the, the two topics that I reviewed, they were trying to improve our success rate by embryo selection. And again, this is a selection, okay? It's not improving the oocyte biology, selection. They failed so far. What about improving implantation? And there is a list of things that have been put on the market for improving implantation. Let me focus just on two. The endometrial scratch, in case a woman complains of uh, uterine itching, you can uh, offer uh, endometrial scratch. <laughs> and the endometrial scratch, and this is a wonderful study by Cynthia Farquhar showing that does not improve live birth rate. And these were uh, a total of uh, 1,364 women randomized, 690 to endometrial scratch, 674 to control, there was really no improvement whatsoever in a live birth rate in this controlled randomized study. So end of the scratch also here. What about the, should we do the transfer in, uh, of embryos always in a frozen cycle? So we should segment IVF because that's really the best way to get success. Hmm, meta-analysis. No difference in cumulative live birth rate whether you do the fresh or you do froze, freeze only. Of course, there are exceptions, I will tell you in a moment. And these exceptions are if you are with the risk of hyperstimulation or if you have a premature rise of progesterone on the day that you are giving ACG, you, of course you should do it. The same that you should do freeze only when you do oncofertility cases. But we are not talking about that. We are talking about all the cases should be a freeze only cycle. So no more fresh transfer. Baloney. No difference in pregnancy rate in this meta-analysis, then uh, in this other study on the human reproduction update, no difference in the clinical live birth rate. The only difference you can see in the bottom is in the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Of course, we already told you that OHSS risk, it's, uh, it, it calls for freeze only, but no difference in uh, spontaneous miscarriage or no difference in the implantation rate between fresh and frozen. New England Journal of Medicine in 2018 data, no difference in pregnancy rate with, with the fresh versus frozen in women that are not at risk for hyperstimulation. And uh, this last paper from uh, very recent, Fertility and Serenity by Moasher, that the freeze-all strategy is beneficial only in high responder, but not if you have a normal responder. And you can see that actually, if you produce up to 14 oocytes, the pregnancy rate is, is much higher with the fresh yes, than not with the frozen. It is only when you have uh, really the risk of hyperstimulation that you should go in the uh, frozen only uh, cycle. So therefore, we, we have now, I hope, that uh, uh, this cumulative meta-analysis, this recent publications put the, the topic to rest that we should not offer freeze all or freeze only to our IVF cycles. In addition, remember that there are also risks for uh, a perinatal outcome because a small for gestational age, yes, is lower risk in uh, frozen embryo transfer, but on the other side, you have uh, the large for gestational age, very high birth weight, which are higher in frozen embryo transfer, and also hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. So, in the overall, there is really no justification to do a freeze-only or freeze-all cycles in, uh, in IVF. Therefore, if you ask me, do you like a fresh tomato or a frozen tomato? I like always a fresh tomato. So for great majority of IVF, the freeze-all strategy is not necessary, adds cost, delay pregnancy, and except those cases that I reviewed with you, OHSS, progesterone rise, or you need to do fertility preservation, or if you do PGTA, that may justify a freeze-only approach. 
So what am I doing? I'm only doing a blastocyst transfer for now. I'm letting nature really do the course. Few meta-analyses support my, uh, my behavior right now. I'm just letting uh, the embryo grow to blastocyst in every single case, and the meta-analysis shows that blastocyst transfer is uh, uh, producing uh, an increase in, uh, uh, in, in, birth, uh, in live birth over day three transfer. And you probably know already this meta-analysis over 2016. And uh, there is a rational, two rational. One is that by, if your lab is good and you do uh, biopsy, for example, in many cases, so you do freeze only uh, in all the cases, you are freezing a blastocyst. So you know how to grow the blastocyst. But the benefit is that by growing to blastocyst, many embryos from day three to five, they will not make it. But that's nature. They are, they are spontaneously arresting their growth and they don't become a blastocyst. So we talk to the patient and say, listen, if there is no blastocyst this cycle, it means it was not meant to be. Do you remember the paper of Sherman Silver, how many months you need to wait for the good one? It's not that if I, if I do uh, a biopsy, I'm going to improve your oocyte biology. The oocyte is what I got. Maybe that was not the right month. That's my, my, and they like that. They don't want to stay on progesterone if they don't need to be. They, they really want to know if that cycle should be repeated right away or not. And the other thing is that by extending to blastocyst, even though it's not the perfect method, but as Grifo showed, may also reduce a little bit the risk of unemployed embryos to grow because between a day three biopsy embryo and day five biopsy embryos, you see that uh, there is a reduction in the, uh, in the number of uh, unemployed embryos that they make it through. So if an embryo is unemployed, most likely or there's a higher chance that they may arrest. And the final slides for the youth in the audience. If you say, well, if, if you are telling us that nothing has changed, what should we do? We need to invest time, energy, resource, your laboratory time in understanding folliculogenesis. We've been doing for four years over and over and over again, time and time over, the same thing. We just stimulated the last two weeks of a folliculogenesis process that we don't even know how many months it takes for an egg that is a, a park, it is in a parking lot called the primordial follicles in the ovary. And then every day, they do this long march of the penguin going towards the ovulation. Maybe it takes four months, maybe it takes five months. We don't even know how long, how long it really takes. So we have no idea what controls really the, the movement of the primordial follicles towards the secondary follicles. So we have some markers to understand, the AMH, but that's just uh, telling us, okay, who is in the pipeline? We have no idea what controls the initial stages of folliculogenesis. Don't even, we don't even know how many eggs there are at birth. When, when, when you talk about this with the student, we, we, we quote, oh, maybe there are one million eggs in the ovaries at birth. One million mm -hmm. eggs. And there were six million when, uh, when the maximum, the peak was when, when the female embryo was uh, six months in intrauterine life. Really? Are we sure about these numbers? Who has counted it? Are we sure that it's one million at birth? I was talking with the professor of anatomy, an Italian one. He said, I think that number is completely wrong. Maybe there are more than that. Maybe there are more than that. But we don't know that. So, and we are propagating messages about outside the biology with very little knowledge. And this is some uh, example of the complexity of the folliculogenesis, and we need to understand and study that. If we want to make an impact on changing, bypassing the limits that we have right now of conventional IVF, because we have not been able to change the oocyte biology. So in, I'm concluding that the oocyte is what needs to, to be studied I call it the conductor of the reproductive symphony orchestra. Uh, so far, we've been uh, unable to change the biology of human reproduction because it's inherently inefficient. We must understand the initial stages of folliculogenesis. Validation, validation, validation data on adds on. Take a step back and just start and continue to do blastocyst transfer if you are already doing it or start to do blastocyst transfer. And if you want to take uh, a, a read just for the things that I've told you in this uh, half an hour, there is this paper that I put together with the Sherman Silver in saying that we have reached the limit with the current methodology. We are trying to do selection, but we have not changed 
yet outside biology. Thank you so much for your attention. Mm -hmm.